Right, hi there everyone. Um, so it's according to my clock here, about seven o'clock on the nose. Um, so first of all, I just want to check that everyone can see the screen that says introduction to lowland grassland dry calcareous presented by Dominic Price. Um, if you can, just put it in the chat and say yay, so that I don't just talk to myself for an hour. Um, so with the, the fact that we're on a webinar, I can't actually see or hear you. So if you're all sort of nodding your heads or putting your thumbs up, I'm afraid that's just for the pleasure of your own homes at this point. Uh, great, thank you. <laughs> there was a little bit of a pause there and I was slightly concerned. Um, <laughs> excellent. Right, so um, just a few little things. So if for any reason you get kicked out of Zoom because let's face it, no one's internet is perfect, then um, you can just join with the link. Uh, if you need to pop out or you know, you've know you got to go out clubbing or something, that's absolutely fine too, because it's being recorded and it will all be put on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm gonna um, play uh, the presentation that Dominic's prepared for us. And then he's gonna join us at the end for a good question and answer session. So have a little think about some questions that you've got that relate to dry calcareous grassland, or in fact, anything to do with lowland grassland as well. Um, and we'll give him a good grilling at the end. You know, we, um, he, he's quite good with his grasses. So if there's anything that you really particularly want to know, um, then, you know, do, do save those questions up. Um, feel free to put those questions in the chat if you want, or there is the option of the Q&A function, um, which you can use as well. So. Right, I'm just going to start his presentation now um, and do start saying if there's any problems at all. Um, you might want to, because I'm playing, it's a pre-recorded, you might want to turn up your sound um, to as high as it can go. Um, I have put my outputs as high as they can go, um, so it just might be your end that needs to be as loud as it can. Um, so let's get started. And in the meantime, I will turn off my... Um, video as well. Right. Hello and welcome to this talk on uh, introduction to lowland dry calcareous grassland with me Dominic Price. In this presentation we're going to look at roughly 20 of the key species that you find in this habitat uh, and the ones which are listed on the National Plants Monitoring Scheme. So it's the ones you want to be fairly familiar with for carrying out MPMS surveys. Before we look at the species, we'll have a general look at the habitat and try and get to grips of what makes lowland dry calcareous grassland and where you're likely to find it. So the general characters of this habitat are that it forms on base rich soils. So these are generally soils which are overlying either limestone or chalk, and they're found in quite a few areas across the UK. We're very lucky in the UK that we have uh, an incredibly varied um, geology. We have you know, calcareous limestone and chalk, we have more acidic granites, we have volcanic features, we have glacial features, and that's part of the reason why we actually have such a good uh, diversity of habitats compared with lots of countries. So first of all, you need you need soils which have formed on top of these rocks to give them this sort of slightly higher pH. And the second thing is they tend to be quite thin and quite porous soils. And because of that, they have very low nutrients. So even in the past, if, if they've been kind of modified by farming and they've had nutrients put on, most of the nutrients kind of run through them very quickly. And in many ways, this is one of the things which have saved the remnant bits of this habitat, because I think lots of them in the past, there was attempts to farm them. And of course, what you realize is if you are pouring nutrients into them, you just keep adding them and adding them and they leach out. The soil, which is not to say that that doesn't happen in some areas of, <clears throat> of chalk grassland, but it's certainly something which has saved a lot of this land because I think a lot of it was just seen as kind of poor quality for farming um, and because of these low nutrients uh, what you tend to get is very high diversity which we'll talk about in a minute. You tend to have quite thin swords and often with bare patches now obviously there's a lot of variation within this habitat and this is not all chalk grass and some chalk grasslands 
um, are rather overgrown and get quite sort of tussocky and, and, and we lose that. But in very good quality, I should say, I often say the term chalk grass and there's just my kind of casual term rather than saying dry lowland calcareous grass and every time. So don't, don't put too much credence into the fact I say chalk. I'm just being lazy. Um, so yeah, in really good quality uh, chalk grassland, you have uh, not only thin swords, but often bare patches. And those bare patches are incredibly important. A, for some of these plants, which uh, they're, you know, they're such poor competitors, they're so small, they really need the bare ground to come in. And also hugely important for uh, invertebrates, which rely on these sort of more open areas, uh, sometimes, you know, just for basking in and getting their body heat up, but sometimes for reproduction, for laying their eggs and, and so forth and so forth. It is, I think it's fair to say, I'm thinking about whether I'm going to get challenged on this, but I think it's probably very likely to be the most diverse habitat we have in this country. Uh, and you can get up to 40 species per square metre, which can make it slightly terrifying um, for survey but absolutely wonderful for botany. Now the reason for this comes back to the low nutrients and it's a slightly sort of curious thing with these sorts of habitats because you think well nutrients are kind of good for plants and if you're a gardener you know you make a real effort to feed your feed your plants and make sure they have all the nutrients they need um, and that's great if you want individual plants to grow very robustly and well and grow large but actually because of that it can be bad for diversity because as soon as you get some plants which are growing uh, you know so huge and big leaves and becoming quite vigorous they will tend to dominate and what you have in chalk grassland is because everything is struggling just to kind of stay alive and make flowers and reproduce they don't really have time to start fighting with each other and they'll just sort of hold on to their own little patch they won't get that big uh, so you know, in a way, the plants are probably not, I mean, all these plants, you know, if you put them in a pot and fed them, they'd be, it's not that they die through nutrients. It's just that, you know, as soon as they get them, it becomes an issue with them fighting each other out. So, um, yeah, that's what tends to maintain the diversity. Another big character of it is you tend to have fine rather than coarse grasses. Now, chalk grass, and along with a lot of other grasses, it's still, you know, it's very grassy. It tends to be the, the grasses forming the dominant cover, but it's very different sorts of grasses. So we've lost, you know, these sort of bigger ones like um, Coxfoot and perennial ryegrass and false oak grass, and we've moved into these finer ones, which is not to say there's not a couple of quite big coarse grasses which do get in, and we're going to look at those later. But in good quality uh, chalk grassland, you're, you know, you've got this much sort of finer mat of grasses. The other weird thing to say about it is they can be quite mossy. Um, there's a couple of mosses, Spheropodium purum and Homalothesium lutescens, which particularly you notice if you go walking in the chalk in the winter months, you can get these huge kind of orange patches. Um, and I think these are mosses which are quite clever. They almost sort of go into cryptobiosis in the summer months when they shrivel up. But in the winter, um, they do really well. And I, part of that is because of this open sward. Uh, you know, you don't tend to get mosses like that in more sort of richer, improved grasses because they simply just get overgrown. So the fact that mosses are there are very much testament to this more kind of open sward. In terms of where you will find calcareous grasslands, so mainly in the south of England. And then you get, you know, these funny little sort of quirks within it. So in the Brex, you tend to get the actual chalk grassland, which is how I tend to incorrectly talk to, uh, refer to most of it. Uh, and then in the north, you tend to get it more on hard limestone. So it sort of turns into limestone grassland. So the catch-all term for all of them is calcareous grassland, and then you sort of get these division between the two. And there's subtle differences in terms of what grows on chalk, what grows on limestone. And obviously, if you're looking at this in, in the uplands, you've got, um, again, a different habitat. I think nearly all the species we're looking at today, um, certainly within limestone grassland, will be there in both lowland and upland. It's just upland, you get a few kind of other speciality species which pop in. So, um, yeah, let's have a look. I think we're looking at about 20 species today. We'll start with the grasses and then we'll go through the forbs alphabetically and see how we get on. So we're going to start, I think we're probably going to do about four grasses, three or four. 
I'm going to start with this uh, very quirky little grass called meadow oat grass. Now we'll look at the flowers in a bit because the flowers um, make it slightly easier, but it's a very good one to be able to do vegetatively. And it's very distinct because of these rigid leaves. So if you look up at the photo at the top, that's a young plant coming through. Um, this is one of the slight drawbacks of doing this online is that you can't you can't feel them. But if you were to touch those leaves, particularly at the top, they almost kind of prick your finger. They're very, very um, almost kind of aggressively rigid. And the, and, you, and the reason is they're absolutely laden with silica. Um, so they can be well, actually, amazingly, they, they do tend to get eaten. I, I'm always amazed at grazing animals which can stomach this sort of thing. But yeah, these very, very rigid sort of silica packed leaves. If you rub your hand over the whole tussock, it almost feels like a porcupine. And you can see that, I think, in the picture that these are leaves, you know, which are very purposeful in the way they're coming up. And if you look at this young leaf here coming out of a stem, can you see that, you know, there's no kind of floppiness in that at all. It's just coming up very, very rigidly. Now, one of the slightly confusing things about this, and you may have spotted it off the photo, is that it has this very distinct double tram line. And that confuses people because uh, that is one of the diagnostics of a group of plants called the poas, the meadow grasses. And that's one of the ways you identify poas, that it has this double tram line. So it can be a bit muddling that people see it in meadow oak grass and go, ooh, double tram line, could that be a poa? I think, in fairness, you're not going to model this with a poa because it's so it's so unique. There's very few grasses with this kind of rigid feel to them. You know, maybe tufted hair grass a bit like this, but very different habitats. And, of course, that has the barbs coming down the side of the leaves. These are not barbed at all. They're just very kind of rough. Um, so, yeah, that's what you're looking for. If you get a really well-formed tussock of it, it will look like that one in the big photo. But in grazed grass, and sometimes you will just be looking for these, um, you know, these sort of prickly white leaves. Um, I wish this grass had a more exciting name in a way, because, uh, well, hey, it's not really a meadow grass. It really is confined to, um, you know, these quite sort of extreme calcareous grasslands. Um, and it would just be easy to remember if it was called porcupine grass. But uh, there we go. I don't make the rules on these things. So that is it vegetatively. In flower, has oaty heads. Here's a new head at the start of the year and there is the head at the end of the year. Now I know it's not very scientific for me to say oaty heads but I think the thing with these there's um, four species of oat grass we have in this country and if you can get your head round the fact all of them look oaty so if you look at that head and say yeah that does kind of look like oat uh, you know it certainly doesn't look like wheat and it doesn't look like barley, and it doesn't look like a rye, and it's very different from the sort of feathery, the agrostuses and the poas. Um, I mean, I guess what it is, it's these awns coming out. It's the fact that it's quite sort of awny, and that gives it this oaty look. Um, because actually, uh, and we're not going to do it today, but if you look at all the oat grasses together, as long as you can say, okay, I'm pretty sure that's an oat, you then divide them into meadow oat grass, which is this porcupine one, downy oat grass, which is very downy and nice and easy, Full oak grass, which is the big one, and it has a few other diagnostics. And then yellow oak grass, which is slightly the odd one out because it has these much more sort of open and, as the name suggests, quite yellow heads. Um, but yeah, they're pretty easy to tell apart. If you can just sort of get into the mindset of thinking, OK, that is an oak grass. So next up, we have... Brachypodium pinnatum, tall grass. Now you remember I said earlier about you know typically this habitat tends not to have these big coarse grasses. It tends to have finer, but there's a couple of exceptions to it, uh, and this is one of them. So um, yeah, this is a slightly problematical species when it gets into um, chalk grasslands, calcareous grasslands. You tend to see it a lot in uh, Gloucestershire. There's big areas of it, and actually the Sussex Downs as well. And it tends to be areas where there's more, there's a prevalence of sheep grazing because the sheep are really not fond of this. Um, and when you get up close to a plant, you can see why. So it often has, particularly late in the year, this quite sort of yellow hue to it, but it's very, very rough. 
Um, it's again another high sort of silica content. If you put your, if you stick your hand into a clump and wiggle your hand about, it has this sort of raspy, sort of high papery sound to it. So there's very very little nutrition to the leaves, um, and yeah, grazing animals are not fond of it, and it can be a massive problem because the thing with grazing is they'll only eat it when they get, you know, they almost out of sort of starvation they will resort to it and therefore the, therefore there's kind of welfare issues with making animals that hungry that they will eat this stuff because they won't sort of happily eat it um and in some grasslands it's yeah you go into an area and it's almost the sort of only species it's almost the equivalent of there's a species called millennia purple moor grass you get in wet heath which again does the same thing that animals aren't mad about eating it and it can take over very quickly so um that's really what you're looking for with this. It's sort of yellow, very rough feeling. When you do get it in flower, it's got these quite sort of stripy heads to it, um, which is um, a familiar thing actually with a lot of these brachypodiums and, and bromes um, that they have these stripy heads. So yeah, and that's why it's on here as part of the survey because it's a very, very kind of indicative species of the degradation of calcareous grassland. So it's a really key one to look out for. Also, if you're visiting the same site year after year, it's one of these things which can spread quite rapidly if there's problems with the management. So it's a very interesting one to track over time. Moving on, we have Bryzomedia quaking grass, which, uh, yeah, absolutely lovely species of this habitat. So a drooping, loose, pyramidal head of dancing sugar puffs. Again, I'm really sort of coming in hard with the science here. I always think of it as sugar puffs. They're wonderfully kind of light, the flower heads and the seed heads, and they, they dance around in the wind. Um, pyramidal, when it's fully kind of out, it tends to have a wider base going up to a narrower top. Um, now, if you don't have any flowers, how would you recognise it? Slightly harder, but what you're looking for is this. And it's a very distinct thing that the leaves at the bottom come out on a right angle. Um, they're quite sort of floppy as well, you can kind of see that in that photo, but yeah, they, they come out very, very much at 90 degrees, and then the rest of the plant sort of goes upwards um, and gets on with being a normal grass. But yeah, if you're early in the season or if the tops have been nibbled off, have a look for that. And once you've got your iron on that, it's quite an easy thing to spot. The next one we're going to look at is Bromopsis erecta upright brome. The bromes are sort of a funny bunch taxonomically actually because they've been split into lots of, um, some of them are bromus, some of them are bromopsis and some of them are brachypodium. Uh, so yeah, they're quite sort of interesting from that perspective. Um, upright brome, again, very much an indicator of calcareous grassland. Um, and it's a funny one. If you're in a sort of a fairly rich meadow and you come across it it's quite an exciting thing to find because it tells you that you know there's a calcareous influence however when the grazing levels drop again similar to the tall grass nothing like as bad as the tall grass but it can be one of these ones which takes over slightly and you can see you know it's quite a tall grass it's quite a big grass and it can often take over to the detriment of some of the more sort of delicate smaller smaller herbs so the flowers are red tinted when they first come out. So um, around sort of May, June, what you'll tend to see with this is these sort of red clumps, which you can sometimes see from a long way away. Yeah, very sort of visually easy to spot. And they're on very, very thin stems. So even in the tiniest breeze, when everything else is still, they'll just pick up the sort of tiniest movement in wind and they, they nod around in a really sort of beautiful way and sometimes it's really odd because as I say it'll be a completely still day nothing else is moving the treetops are still and there'll be the upright brome kind of waving away in an almost imperceptible breeze but the big big diagnostic on this it's a vegetative one and it is these hairs so these are referred to uh, well certainly by me and I think it's a term other people use as camel's eyelashes um, and the key thing with this, it's not a hairy grass, but it's got eyelashes because there's lots of other grasses, particularly downy oak grass, which grows with this. And downy oak grass is just covered in hairs. Upright brome, it's not covered in hairs, but it has these eyelashes. And I think you can sort of see what I mean by eyelashes in that picture there. 
And yeah, just to say it can be a problem. It's a very, very lovely grass, but when too much of it gets going, it can really sort of knock out that diversity a bit. So uh, yeah, there you have it, Bromopsis erecta, upright brome. So I think now we are moving to herbs. And we're going to start off with the lovely, lovely, lovely harebell. Um, so what can I tell you about harebell? I'm sure it's one you all know. Uh, the, the flowers look like bells. They come up on these very, very slender stems. So uh, they, again, they have this sort of nodding, nodding thing to them. There's a few, there are other harebells available. So uh, yeah, just sort of don't always presume if you see a bell like blue flower that it is harebell. Um, the sort of clustered bellflower, nettle uh, bellflower you find as well. But this is definitely the most kind of delicate of them all. Um, in terms of doing it from leaf, the leaves are quite cool because they look like that. They're sort of um, almost sort of ivy shaped in a while, but they're very, they're very lobed and quite sort of rounded and they're almost um, sort of broader than they are longer. The, the confusing thing about the basal leaves, you look at this, this is a really nice photo because it shows two types of leaf. Sorry, that's my phone going off. I'm just going to silence that. Um, can you see, you've got a basal leaf and then the these are the flowering stems coming up. This one hasn't quite flowered yet with completely different leaves on it. And I think it can really fox people because you think, well, that's all, you know, that almost looks like one plant coming up from the other one. So it's one of these ones with a real kind of division between the two. And it's, it's quite a kind of typical design of plants, because I guess the purpose is the basal leaves are there to catch sun and just sort of get energy, so they're that shaped. And then the stem leaves are really, you know, by that point, it's putting its energy into flowering, so it doesn't want to sort of go on making these big leaves. So, um... Yeah, that's the purpose of it, but it can be um, quite confusing when you see both of them together. Sorry about all the phone noise. Um, okay, so we now move on to this plant. Now I have very mixed feelings about dwarf thistle. It's, um, it's a lovely flower and it's really, really interesting because it's, uh, the way it flowers it's unique, which I'll get on to in a minute. I'm just, I'm too excited about this one. It's all coming once. So yeah, in terms of the leaves, it's very, very prickly. And this is my mixed feeling about it because dwarf thistle, as much as it's absolutely lovely, can A, make surveying in chalk grass and an absolute nightmare because every time you kind of kneel down, well, actually surveying and photography, because I've often had a thing where I found a fantastic orchid and I've wanted to take a photo of it. And uh, yeah, there's, you know, you, you immediately kneel or sit or put your hand on a dwarf thistle and they're agonisingly prickly. Um, and they can really sort of ruin picnics in, in chalk grass. And so they're problematical from that. But they're very, very uh, unique flowers. And the, and the thing that they do is, you know, which is very different from all the other thistles is this prostrate on ground. So you can see there you've got the sort of basal whirl of leaves, which is quite typical of lots of thistles, but the flower sits right down in the axis of those leaves. So whereas with other flowers, you've got the, you know, like nearly every single flower, you know, has the leaves on the base and then the flower comes up. I think in this country, I can't think of any other flower which does this. It's a very, very sort of unique uh, way of growing. Um, and it's very clever because, of course, it doesn't get grazed. And I think this is a, it's a double whammy because it's very low and the leaves are very prickly. So you'd have to be a very, very brave sheep slash cow to try and graze that flower off. Uh, and as a result, they're very successful. I guess the other part of being this is a sort of water conservation. And this these plants can grow on very, very dry habitats. Um, and they do quite well out of it. So, um, yeah, they're quite interesting from that perspective. And very much an indicator of good quality chalk calcareous grasslands so even though uh, it can be a bit distressing when you kneel on them you have to sort of cheer yourself up by saying well you know because they're here that means we're in very nice grassland as you kind of curse yourself for, for kneeling in one so yeah moderately challenging now another thistle we've got on the list is creeping thistle and I think the reason that is on the list is this is this is kind of the other spectrum of thistles this is a, a thistle which is much more indicative of um, slightly polluted, slightly perturbed habitats, 
However, now I'm not, because I'm not doing, I'm sure you all know Creek and Thistle, so I wasn't going to do slides on how to identify it, but I'm just sort of making the case for Creek and Thistle. It's an amazing pollen and nectar source, particularly early on in the year. So it's a really, really tricky one because you definitely do not want to be finding lots of it in chalk grassland. I mean, when you do get it, it's sometimes in areas if, say, the cattle have been given supplementary feed and there's an area where they've dunged in and that's boosted the nutrients. Um, but it often can be where there's a sort of agricultural influence, you know, where, I mean, this is a typical example because you can see this is in Wiltshire. In the background, you can see these sort of banks of very good chalk grassland. And this was on the edge of a field of wheat and the nut you know the fertilizer from the wheat was starting to sort of leach into the chalk and there was a big bank of thistle but having had a day where i hadn't seen that many butterflies came here and yeah just absolutely awash with them and it was quite an interesting moment because i thought yeah yeah all those years i've been really rude about creek and thistle and here it is supporting this you know incredible diversity of butterfly life so it's an interesting one and I think you sort of have to keep an open mind about these things but you know in terms of pure botanical terms this is a species which tends to indicate that you've got slight problems with your habitat but uh yeah keep an open mind about creeping thistle I think that's what I'd say now we move on to philopendula vulgaris dropwort so we'll start off with this one vegetatively and that is what it looks like uh, vegetatively and it's an interesting one I put opposite here because actually the, the upper leaves tend to be opposite but actually as you go down the stem they get a bit more alternate but it's I think the thing to learn is this degree of toothiness so it's almost like a lobed toothiness um, I mean the only thing which is at all like this really is possibly salad bonnet but I think with salad bonnet the leaves are flat on the stem so they would have actually in this photo they'd be facing you it's a much easier one to photograph as a result because they face you um and with salad bonnet they're much more sort of two these are these are slightly sort of uh deeper almost kind of lobed rather than toothed but as soon as it flowers it becomes very distinctive and here it is with the flower and the leaves as well now, the only issue with the flowers is that I think for so many people, the first time they see it, uh, say, ooh, it's a lovely bit of meadowsweet. Now, of course, meadowsweet is also a philopendula, philopendula ulmeria, and they are very similar. And I remember being completely foxed the first time I saw dropwort. It's much rarer than meadowsweet. And I was thinking, what on earth is meadowsweet doing on this dry, dry chalk bank? And yeah, it was dropwort. Now, what I would say about the flowers, the, the flower head as a whole is smaller than meadowsweet, but the individual flowers are a bit bigger. So it's a smaller flower made of fewer, bigger florets, if that makes sense. But this leaf, very, very different. If you're familiar with meadowsweet, it has much, much sort of broader leaves, I guess, because it grows in damp habitat, so it can afford to produce kind of more leaf matter. But um, yeah. I think it's nice to sort of see it all together. So, you know, in flower, nice and easy, just don't meddle, muddle it up with meadow, sweet muddle with meadow. And in leaf, just, yeah, if you just try and sort of learn, that's what it looks like. Very sort of upright leaves as well. And I guess that's the orientation of the leaflets. So when the stem is coming up, they're still pointing up to the sky. So, uh, yeah, it is a lovely species and again you can sort of see the bugs on that flower very very good for pollinators particularly dipterans you tend to see a lot of flies uh, and quite a few sort of flying beetles on it as well so big big pollen nectar source so moving on to galium album hedge bed straw i'm in older books uh, it's called galium malugo it's had a name change quite quickly uh, and the reason is album because it has, has white flowers. So the first thing says whirls of leaves, and that is the same for all bed straws. That what that's what sort of defines the bed straw family in this country. Interestingly, the bed straw family, which is the Rubiaceae, in um when I uh, when I worked in Africa for a bit, uh, the Rubiaceae in Africa is called the coffee family, which completely confused me, and it made me think we're very parochial with a lot of our taxonomy. 
that in this country we're very much yes anything ruby aci is a bed straw and uh, yeah it is uh the same family as coffee and it's a bonkers family the ruby aci because it has you know these tiny things in it has coffee in, and then it has a lot of big massive trees in the rainforest also belong to the ruby aci so yeah it's a bewilderingly complicated family so just bringing it back to bed straws one of the key things with this one is it doesn't stick to you uh, so I'm sure you're all familiar with cleavers, sticky willy, sticky jack, whatever you call it. And that's the one you can be very juvenile and stick it onto people's backs when they're walking and see how long it takes them to notice. It was one of our beloved things at university was doing that to lecturers who probably knew we were doing it and just ignored it because it's so juvenile, but quite funny. This one, it can look a little bit like cleavers, you know, dimension wise and size wise it's similar, but it hasn't got any barbs on it at all. So if you try and stick it on someone, it just falls straight off again. And a multitude of creamy flowers. So cleavers um, is not is not big on flowering. You do see the odd flower on it, but it's not really a big flowering one. Whereas this one, yeah, you get this wonderful kind of um, drift of flowers. And when you get a lot of it, it can almost be matte forming. So you get these huge sort of patches of white. The flowers individually are very very small but because there's so many of them on a head they produce uh, this quite sort of distinct appearance and yeah quite sweet smelling if you kind of get your nose I don't think it's a smell you catch from sort of meters away but uh, if you stick your nose in it um, it's quite impressive so Galium album hedge bed straw very lovely species And then we move on. I'm trying to think if I think this might be the only orchid we're looking at today. And this is fragrant orchid. Now these are actually, ooh, do I want to get into it? I'll mention it. It's these have been split into uh two different ones. I think uh the one you're gonna be finding will be chalk fragrant orchid, because they're kind of named after the habitat. So that makes it a bit easier. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. I just thought I'd mention it in case you're out with someone who then starts talking about the different types and you think, oh, I've never heard of that before. So yeah, just be aware there may be people you come across who split these into uh, different types of fragrant orchid. Um, now, how do you identify a uh, fragrant orchid? The first thing to say is that it's very tall, the spikes. They've got a real kind of height on them and they're this pinky purple colour. The second thing is they have these long hypanthia. So a hypanthium, uh, it's a very posh word for a nectar tube. And you can see, I think in both photos, can you see that really long tube coming out the back? And that has got the nectar in right down at the bottom. And the purpose of that is just to make sure you've got a jolly good chance of being pollinated because any sort of uh, insect which is coming to get that nectar, they can't avoid sticking their head right into the flower to try and get down to the bottom of the tube. I mean, it's so long in this species, you think, uh, yeah, that's incredible sort of evolution over time. And I guess there's insects which have evolved, you know, incredibly long tongues that they can get down and get to the nectar. So that's why it's done it. And the third thing to say, which is a slightly obvious thing from the name of it, is that it's fragrant. But the cool thing about that is actually there's very few orchids if any, in this country, which really have a strong smell. I mean, orchids are obviously incredibly showy and wonderful and, you know, things to look at, but they tend to be completely odourless. And fragrant orchid has got a really nice smell to it. Again, a bit like the uh, hedge bed straw, you've got to stick your nose in it. It's not a smell which will sort of assault you as you as you walk past them. But yeah, have a good sniff of it. From a distance, you know, it's slightly like common spotted, you know, in terms of dimensions. But um, common spotted obviously has all the sort of blotches and spots on the flowers. And it doesn't have that spur coming out the back, the hypanthium. And it doesn't smell. And it has spotty leaves. So, in fact, it's not really like it at all. I think it's like it if you're a long way away, put it that way. But um, this one is very much an indicator of your calcareous grassland. Look, I finally learned how to say calcareous grass and can stop saying chalk. It's only, it's only taken a few minutes. Okay, so we now move on to hypercarious radicator, common cats here. So, uh, yeah, now this is one of the, uh, the slightly dreaded uh, yellow composites. So they're these things which all look a little bit like dandelion from a distance. Uh, but there's a few really kind of key things 
which make them different. So the first thing with common caps here, and it's a nice thing because it helps you remember it. So I'm just going to bring up all of this because, yeah, I want to see this picture. Um, slightly fuzzy picture, which I apologise for, but it's got, cat's ear has got cat's ears on the flower stem. And can you see those little kind of black tip flaps? Now I know they don't look exactly like a cat's ear. You have to sort of think of the right cat. And I think what it is, it's those, um, you know, those Egyptian cats you get sort of in, in hieroglyphs on pyramids and stuff, which have those very big pointy ears. So that's the cat you're thinking of. Don't think of another cat which doesn't have those because it has to fit this narrative. And uh, there's no other yellow composites with that on the stem. And also it's named after that, which makes it really nice and easy. So common cats here. Um, yeah, look for those cats here. Um, it has these filaments on the leaf base. And what that is, if you pick a leaf down at the base of it and pull it away, it tends to always come away with these filaments sticking out. It's got these very sort of... Um, almost like sort of arteries going up where the vascular uh, tissue is. So rather than just snapping off, they tend to sort of pull out almost with these sort of guts coming out of it. And they're very strong, the filaments. If, you, um, if you're if you whiling away a few minutes sitting in a chalk grass and listening to Skylark singing or something, you can try and pull the whole filament out. And if you, if you gently snap the leaf bit by bit and just pull it off, you can end up with these really long filaments. This is how I entertain people on a, the flowers course, just to sort of pass a few moments. So yeah, that's quite distinctive. And the other thing to say is it's got, uh, it has hairs. Now, I should say about the hairiness, it can sometimes be very hairy and sometimes very hairless. So the hairiness is really, really variable and that can throw people. But the thing to learn is, yes, yeah, sometimes it's hairy, sometimes it's not hairy. But the key thing is the hairs are unforked because that is a very good way of separating it from another species which we're not doing today, which is called rough hawkbit, Leontodon hispidus. And rough hawkbit has forked hairs on it. So uh, if you find something like this, I mean, the cat's ears on the stem should separate it out. But if you're not sure about it, just look at the hairs and work out if they're split or not. And if they're not split, you've probably got common cats here. Common cats here sort of pops up on a few different habitats because you do get it in heathland as well. Um, it has quite a sort of broad range of, of places it likes to grow. Moving on, and I think this is the first member of the pea family we've had today. So this is horseshoe vetch. Now, it looks a little bit like birds for trefoil, um, but the leaves are very, very different because birds for trefoils almost got that clover-like trefoil with the three leaflets together. This one has leaflets uh, in opposite rows, so very, very different in leaf. Also, the flowers are different. Typically, I'd say the individual flowers are slightly smaller than you get on birds for trefoil, but there's more of them. And you get this interesting structure with them that some of them are in a horseshoe shape, and you can see that at the top of the photo. But if you look down at the bottom, actually, sometimes you get a full circle where they're literally sort of coming out in in a ray. I mean, again, you can sort of see the base of it where those shorter ones are. But uh, yeah, that's sort of and I I never know with this is whether the horseshoe names comes from that shape of the flower or whether it comes from what I call the crazy seed pods. So look at those seed pods. You think a bird's foot trefoil very much just has a straight pod. It comes out looking a bit like a bird's foot because they're quite pointy. These are more dangly. But yeah, I just think these pods are absolutely brilliant. Imagine trying to push those through a through a, um, a bean stringer. Um, yeah, and I think, can you see that those also look like horseshoes? Uh, and I don't know where the name comes from. And as, as those ripen, they actually drop off uh, individually, they kind of plop off one by one, uh, which is quite interesting. So there you go, horseshoe vetch. Much more sort of indicative of this sort of dry calcareous as well. Birds for trefoil, you do get it on um, calcareous, but it also sort of pops up in neutral meadows as well. And this is much more on the sort of dry chalk. Um, very important food plant for the blue butterflies. I'm saying the blue because I now can't remember which one has this as a food plant, but it's one of them. Um, no, I'm not going to say. I, I'm, well, I, am. I think it's Adonis blue, but I could be wrong. Look it up. But certainly um, where you get this, you tend to get blue butterflies. So it's very important for them. 
moving on and yeah quite a nice easy one oxide daisy i think you probably all know this uh and it's essentially just like a very large daisy um i don't think you'll muddle it up with daisy because it's much much bigger it's much much taller um but we'll just have a little look that's what you look for if you're doing it vegetatively um can you see that very sort of um What's, it's what's called spatulate, because it looks like a spatula. Imagine something you kind of flip eggs with, um, but very lobed. And as uh, the plant develops, these become more and more kind of divided on the way up. I just want to have a look at this, because it was funny. I was looking through my photos, and I picked this one, and I suddenly, it's uh, it's got a slight optical illusion that if you, look, if you stare into the middle of the flower for long enough, and then look out, can you see it's got... Uh, this swirl pattern and it's really hard to work out how it's formed but I think this is one of these wonderful um you know there's all these sort of chaos theory these Mandelbro fractals you get in nature and I think this might almost qualify as one of those but while we're kind of our eyes are spinning looking at this just to say you know one of the key things with daisies is uh, the, uh, well, they're in this family called, well, the technical term is the Asteraceae, but also the Compositae, and it's because they have a composite flower head, and it's made up of lots of flowers. So what you're looking at with, with uh, Daisy is not a flower, you're looking at a head with lots and lots of flowers, and actually you can really see it here on this magnification. But the interesting thing is those things around the edge, which is very tempting to call petals, are not. They're called ray florets. And the ones in the middle are called disc florets. So we have two completely different flowers. And you can just see at the bottom of some of the ray florets that they've got their own stigma and stamen. And if you ever pull one off, you will see that essentially you have an entire, entire flower, entire, entire flower uh, in your hand. And each one of them is a completely sort of separate thing. There's also a very interesting thing with the daisies that sometimes the ray florets and the disc florets attract um, different pollinators. But these are a highly, highly evolved flower. You know, in terms of evolution, they came sort of right down the down the scale because they'd mastered. I mean, there's such design to this. It's absolutely incredible. And of course, the other thing to say is they're one of the great species which has mastered aerial seed dispersal. Um, and think of a dandelion or a thistle with that downiness with this stuff called pappus attached to the seeds. Um, so, yeah, absolute kind of design triumph because, uh, you know, in the past there were loads of seeds which just dropped onto the ground beneath the plant. There were some seeds which kind of mastered hanging onto animals and getting carried this way. But the daisy family is just kind of completely out there in terms of their seed dispersal. So they're a very, very kind of successful family from that point of view but um i think it's really easy with things like daisies to just sort of get used to seeing them and sometimes it's just worth spending time particularly with a hand lens actually looking at the just the sheer beauty of these things anyway slight tangent slight daisy tangent there so we move on to uh, another very very beautiful flower and this is fairy flax linum catharticum so very, very delicate, these thread-like stems and these tiny, tiny oblong leaves very much in pairs, as you can see there. And when it flowers, you just get these beautiful, very, very delicate flowers. And again, very beautiful close up. It's quite easy just to kind of pass them by and not spend enough time looking at them. But I love the, um, the venation on the petals leading into them. And then when they go over, and you can see that at the bottom of the photo, they have these really cool stripy seed pods. So if you're out surveying late in the season, if you're out in kind of August, I guess, or possibly end of July, if it's been a particularly sort of hot and early summer, just look out for these stripy heads. And they're quite sort of domed in their structure. They sort of remind me slightly of the Brighton Pavilion, that they sort of broaden out and come up to a point. But the stripes are, are really cool, because of course late summer most of the leaves have gone over, so all you've got to go from is the stripy pods. So that's quite a sort of key one to look out for. And then we move on to Pylocella officinarum mouse hawkweed. Sorry, I haven't unitalicized mouse hawkweed. Um, and this, again, is a 
very kind of distinctive plant in terms of its leaves. There's nothing else like that at all. And they do kind of look like mouse's ears. So they're very, very hairy, but also they've got this uh, very unique white underside. And you can just see that there in the leaves that are curling around. So they're covered with a sort of felt, a felty background. Um, as well as having hairs, they have these sort of slight warts on. I think a lot of the warts actually lead to hairs. That's where the hairs originate from. But you can often kind of see the wartiness as well. This is an interesting one habitat-wise because it does, uh, so it loves very sort of extreme dry calcareous grassland. It's also very, very happy on heathland, which is where this photo is taken. So the keen-eyed among you may have spotted a um, bilberry out of focus in the foreground, doing a slight photo bomb there. Um, and there's a little moss called Polychicum juniperinum, possibly, which I think is Polychicum polyphrum uh, in the foreground. So yeah, this was taken in a heathland. That's my disclaimer for this one. Uh, and yeah, which is the other place it grows. And I think basically it's an, it's an extremophile. And there's a few species like this, which are unusual because you get used to seeing them in one habitat and then you find them in another. You will never find this in the middle. You will never find this in kind of rich... Uh, kind of neutral grasslands at all it only grows at the extremes and the reason is you know it's very small it's a very very good survivor and because of these hairs it can cope with real kind of drought and periods of, of low rainfall but it can't cope with getting overgrown the other thing you're looking for when you identify it are these um sulfur yellow flowers um now, because this is actually, we've come in vegetatively, which makes it quite sort of easy to do, but this is another yellow composite. It's another flower looking slightly like a dandelion. But what I would say is, yeah, the colour of it. I mean, there's lots of things different about it. It's smaller. I'm sorry about this photo. It's weird, actually, if you photograph it in sunlight, it's almost like the camera can't handle, well, my camera, my cheapy camera, couldn't handle the sulfur yellow. It's so intensely yellow. Um, it's got very um, blunt ended um, petals, looking very like Bart Simpson's hairstyle. In fact, they've, they've got that. Um, can you see the way they're sort of frayed at the ends? But um, yeah, this photo doesn't really do it justice. But it, if you see a uh, a mousey hawkweed next to a dandelion, or in fact next to any other member of the composite, it's such such a different shade of yellow so that's a good way of signing out but to be honest i would you know do it off the leaves because they they are so different from the others so we move on now to hoary plantain plant plantain plantain plantago media now this is a very middling plantain so the other plantains you commonly find in terrestrial habitats a greater plantain and ribwort plantain. And ribwort plantain, Plantago lanceolata, has got these spear-like long leaves. Great plantain, Plantago major, has got these very broad sort of wide leaves. And Plantago media, I think as the Latin name kind of suggests, is very much in the middle. So it's not as broad as major, and it's not as lanceolate as lanceolata. So it's a very kind of middling plantain. And they're very, it's a very nice shape to the leaves, actually. I like, they sort of almost look like dollop shaped with that nice sort of rounded thing to them. But the key difference with this is these flowers. Because, without wish, wishing to be rude about the plantains, I'd say ribwort plantain and greater plantain, they're not, um, how shall I put this? You don't, you don't, you don't tend to find them in floral arrangements. Put it that way. They're not the showiest flowers. Um, which is what makes this one so striking, because actually when these are in full whack, I have certainly mistaken them for orchids. And I know that so looking at that photo, you'll be like, uh, really? But honestly, from a long distance, because of this pink colour, because of the way they're held up, they're really, really showy. And I think people are surprised when they see them, because they think, yeah, that's not a plantain, that's something much more exotic. Um, so yeah, very, very showy very impressive flowers so, uh, and again this one's very much calcareous indicator species and then we move on i think we've got about three left now on to a uh, cowslip primula veris so one of the very sort of early uh, flowers of spring as i'm sure you know primula veris obviously veris meaning of the spring 
and it's got these heads of nodding tubular flowers. So primrose uh, is much more open and tends to be slightly sort of flatter and um, certainly not nodding in the wind. Um, and this one, yeah, much more sort of, uh, well, yeah, tubular. Can you see the way they sort of, they don't quite open up as much as um, primrose does? Leaf. Sorry, I changed leaves to <laughs> to the singular. The singular of leaves is not leaves. So yeah, apologies about that. Anyway, we'll move on because I have to explain this clear stem at base. You're like, oh. Now what I mean by this is the way you, this is how you tell apart cowslip from primrose. So in cowslip, the leaf blade closes down before the base and then you've got a clear bit of stem, which you can see primrose, it's, Pretty much the whole thing is a blade. There's no kind of stem on its own. So I hope that makes sense. Primrose much more sort of leafy, cowslip a bit more kind of stemmy, if I can use that as an adjective. And then we move on to Ranunculus bulbosus, bulbous buttercup. Now, it's funny when I sort of was just starting off with botany, I had this big thing about separating out meadow buttercup and creeping buttercup and you know, thinking of those as the big ones. And I was aware there was this thing called bulbous buttercup, uh, and I hadn't really sort of got my head around it. Now, I think maybe because I work a lot more on the chalk, this seems to be the main thing that I find. So what I would say about bulbous buttercup, if you go to a grassland early in sort of May, well, actually in you know early summer, so May into perhaps early June, and it is absolutely awash with yellow, it's very likely to be bulbous buttercup because when you get bulbous buttercup you tend to get a lot of it um, so a lot of these grasslands in the early summer this is the species you're going to find so i think actually there's a lot more bulbous buttercup around than maybe people think um the leaf is intermediate between creeping and meadow now we're just we're not going to look at the other species so you're sort of going to have to slightly take my word on this Creeping buttercup tends to have quite a sort of um, almost continuous leaf. It's not that divided. Meadow buttercup, very, very divided. And I think if you just find the leaf of this, you tend to look at it and go, mm, it's not, you know, it's not quite as sort of entire as I would expect creeping to be, but it doesn't look quite as divided as meadow. So if you find a leaf like that, I mean, it's basically if you find a leaf and you're confused by it, there's a very good chance it would be bulbous but really the key thing you're looking for to confirm it's bulbous is that I mean this is before I'm going to then talk about how to do it in flower which is incredibly easy this is just if you don't have flowers so if you think you might have a bulbous just feel down towards the bottom you don't have to pull it up you can sometimes just rootle a little bit of soil off at the base and you should see you get this really kind of quite impressive bulb shape to it uh, and that's where the name bulbous comes from but by far the easiest way of doing it is to wait for it to flower and it has backward sepals so there's two buttercups here on the left is bulbous and on the right is um ooh, i can't remember it's not bulbous it's either meadow or creeping but can you see that's what i mean by backward sepals and it's really really unique because pretty much all flowers have the sepals supporting the petals you know how they sort of open up and they just stay there at the base and um yeah bulbous buttercup has gone for a completely different approach to the world of sepals and you can actually you can still see they're sort of they've got quite a good strength to them because they come down and sort of clamp onto the stem so i can see you know i can see how it works it's just weird because if it was really good why don't more flowers do it it's a really kind of unique Thing to do but uh, yeah so just remember bulbous backwards the two B's when you've got the sepals and that makes that one quite easy finally we are going to end with uh, thyme wild thyme thymus vulgaris this is quite a sort of tricky one uh, taxonomically I think on the NPMS list it's listed as two different things um, because yeah it, it's a bit confusing in terms of species um, sometimes tum, thymus vulgaris, sometimes just called thymus sort of ag. It's a bit of a kind of cluster of species. Um, the things you're looking for with it is it's mat forming, and you can see it here in this photo, really sort of spreading out uh, with small opposite, slightly hairy leaves. We'll look at the leaves in a bit more detail in a minute, actually. Tightly bundled light purple flowers, 
Uh, so very much this sort of, I mean, this is dead nettle family, the Lamiaceae. So these very lipped flowers in tight clusters, mildly scented. And I think this is quite a key thing to say about thyme. It can often be disappointingly unaromatic. So you sometimes find clumps of it and there's just no smell at all. Sometimes you get a bit more. I think there's another species called large flower lime and that tends to be the one which is kind of super, super smelly. And certainly when you find thyme in the Mediterranean, which I think is probably a different type, of, you know, it's very, very aromatic. But in this country, you know, it's not great. It's not as good as the ones you sort of buy specifically for your garden. So here are the leaves. And this is what I mean about, can you see the sort of hairiness on and their opposite? And all I will caution with this one is you can muddle it up with this species. And this is a rock rose. And sort of dimensions of leaf wise. I mean, rock rose is bigger. The leaves are longer, but they are slightly similar. And the way you tell apart if you've got it in leaf is rock rose they're longer leaves but they also have if you're very beady eyed can you see at the base of the leaves on rock rose on that photo on the right they've got these these things called stipules which are at the leaf base and they're long they're little almost sort of filaments coming out and that's what to look for because these can when you get small rock rose they can be very easy to model now of course as soon as rock rose flowers ta-da it's absolutely fine so there's no way you're going to muddle it up in flower but it's just one to be aware of uh, when they're vegetative. So that is just a kind of brief look at uh, some of the key species you find in calcareous grass. And as I said, it's a um, massively diverse habitat and it can be a bit overwhelming. And I think all I would say about that is um, don't be overwhelmed. I mean, I think sometimes it's one of those habitats where you just have to enjoy it and enjoy you know listening to the yellow hammers and the skylarks sing and all the butterflies coming in and out and don't sort of if you're early on in botany don't sort of get too worked up about it and you will get there in the end you know it's, it's a tougher habitat to do particularly if it's in a grazed habitat which is obviously the best chalk and calcareous grasslands are grazed but as a result they tend to have a lot you know sometimes a lot of the flower heads are eaten off and stuff which can make it even harder but um yeah it's a really really lovely habitat it's a very rare habitat and it's a really kind of key one to look at as part of this monitoring scheme because you know even though we lost a lot of uh calcareous grass and kind of post-war when they're plowed up we're still you know losing it now it's still every now and again it gets built on or just neglected and overgrown so it's a really really important one to keep monitoring uh, and allow scientists to kind of get this picture of what it's doing. Um, there's a few slides coming up with credits. Um, a lot of the photos were mine, but I had to kind of delve into um, the wonderful Wikimedia images um, to get lots of the photos off. So there's the credits coming up for the people who have very kindly put their photos on that. I would hugely recommend, if you're not too precious about your own photos, of putting them on Wikimedia because they're there for anyone to use. Um, you get credited, but it just means you you provide them to the nation for free use. Uh, and it's really, really useful, actually, when you're researching these things, just to have a look at different um, photos of them. So huge thanks to all those people. And I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and yeah, I hope this inspires you to get out there and start surveying. OK, all the best. Bye. Right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just going to um, make sure that Dominic can join us. Um, bear with me one moment while I do the little Zoom things that I need to do. Um, there he is. I'm just going to ask him. Okay. So when you're ready, Dom, you can turn yourself off. Oh, hey, yeah. Hi. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, great to talk about calcareous grasslands. It was really good. It's my favourite habitat, probably. So uh, yeah. Um, a couple of the little comments. First of all, um, someone said they really liked the explanation of the Latin names. So they they said it makes it more memorable. So they said thanks for that. Um, 
The first question that's come in here is, do you have evidence that yellow rattle can be effective in controlling the tall grass, the brachypodium? Ooh, I don't know. I mean, you tend to find rattle in, it tends to be less prevalent in those sort of ultra chalky grasslands where you get tall grass. So I have not seen them growing together. Okay. So no, I've not, I've not seen that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I think probably it would struggle to have much of an effect on tall grass. It's very good at um, getting on top of those sort of medium sized, slightly tusky grasses. But I think if it was a battle of tall grass versus rattle, I think the tall grass would probably win that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, are orchids generally an indicator for calcareous soil or only the one that you showed? Um, so certainly the one that I showed and possibly some others, um, which one did we, was it fragrant? Yeah. So fragrant and actually fragrant orchid itself has now been split into two subspecies. So there is the calcareous one and another one. Um, but no, the, the orchids of chalk are fragrant orchid, pyramidal orchid is extremely good for it. Common spotted, but that tends to grow anywhere. Yeah. Bee orchid is a little bit chalky, but then there's a ton of other orchids, you know, lots and lots, which grow in all manner of yeah, um, sort of specialist orchids. You know, they they tend to be on the calcareous soil. I've got a fly flying around here. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was at a lovely um, calcareous grassland site last weekend, and um, it's supposed to have frog orchid, but unfortunately, I didn't find any. But I did find fragrant orchid, um, so yeah, that was nice. Frog orchid is disappointingly small. I think I spent I spent a long time looking for it, thinking, um, yeah. you know, having seen it on the pictures, and then because it grows just up the road from Salisbury, and the plants are about four centimeters tall, which is not what I was led to believe from looking at these wonderful pictures in the book showing this big old orchid. I think it's the same with burnt tip. Actually, people can be very surprised by burnt tip because it's much smaller than it looks in the books. I think all books. <laughs> All books should almost have a compulsory thing where they have a finger in the screen with the orchid next to it. Because <laughs> uh, we've all done it when you've, you've pictured something tiny and then blown up the picture to make it look impressive. So, um, and plus frog, frog orchid also has the misfortune of being green coloured, which is about the hardest, hardest thing to look for in a green landscape. Yeah, definitely. So in answer to your question, um, you can get orchids in all sorts of grasslands, neutral or... Um, you know, you can get your heath spotted on the more sort of acid grasslands, you, but equally you can get like your early purple orchids and your common spotted in woodlands. So it doesn't necessarily just mean that they're, they're orchids, it's calcareous, but that fragrant orchid is a particular one of that and pyramidal. So. They're definitely an indicator of good quality habitat. So you don't get them in places where there's pollution and high nutrients and lots of disturbance. So they tend to, where, whichever habitat you're in, they tend to tell you you're in quite a nice, I say nice, using it in the most unscientific way, but yeah, nice, nice habitats. Um, so somebody just wanted to say thank you for this wonderful and very useful presentation. I do have one question, which is not identification related. I was just wondering how to control tall grass, <laughs> this is clearly, a, or other dominant grasses, if grazing is obviously not an option in that sense. Um, I suppose cutting maybe. Um. Yeah, there is cutting. I mean, there's some extreme circumstances where they've had to use herbicide on tall grass where it's a real problem. Because even when you've got grazing, if you've got sheep grazing, if anything, that can lead to more of a tall grass problem because the sheep are extremely good at eating every other plant except the tall grass. So they actually give the tall grass a kind of upper hand. Um, Obviously, cattle grazing is the best, but yeah, you can do cutting. It te cutting tends to be less prevalent in chalk grassland, but mainly because of the topography that often chalk grassland, what we've got left of our chalk, chalk grassland tends to be on steep slopes, uh, which is why sort of inherently they tend to be less cut. But um, yeah, if you had it on a flat area, you can cut. There's an interesting trial down the road from us here in a place called Martin Down where they have started cutting it to reduce it. So that does, that does work if you can do it, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a real problem when it gets in in huge quantities. It's a really, it's a difficult one to deal with. Okay. 
Um, uh, someone else has just said, lovely presentation. And are these plants typical for the Salisbury Plain? Yeah, ish. I mean, Salisbury Plain has got its own oddities because it's it's um it's an unusual. There's unusual management, and there's very few places with that sort of level of um isolation, certainly from sort of humankind, apart from the military training on it. But yeah, I'd say so. I mean, Salisbury Plain is fairly indicative of chalk grassland, and the MPMS species are fairly indicative of that. So yeah, I'd say. That would work pretty well on that. Yeah. Um, someone's just asked uh, when's the ideal time of year to do our survey, so I'll take that one. Um, so we just say um, late spring, early summer. Now, as you probably most of you aware, uh, we're experiencing a bit of a late spring, so good couple of weeks, maybe three behind, depending on where you are. Um, but if you haven't been able to get out and do your first survey yet, then don't worry. Um, if you're new to the scheme, um, it's absolutely fine to just do the one survey this year and spend that time setting up your plots and getting your permissions and stuff first, and then do that late summer um, survey so that you're all ready to go next year. So that's absolutely fine. No worries about that. Um, just begun to recce my square on the West Wales coast, a lot of sheep pasture. What's the best way to ID the fine habitat of grassland for sheep, like heavily grey sheep grassland? Pasture. As in, sorry, what's the best way to identify the habitat or? or the... Within MPMS, we obviously have lowland grassland and then that breaks down into um, your acid, your neutral, your calcareous. But if you're basically looking at stuff that's nibbled down to a nub, I suppose the question is, is there any way that you can identify which specific habitat that is? Yeah, so it's really hard in sheep grazed. I was out on a site today, which was actually a damp water meadow, but it had sheep on it and I couldn't find a single species which was indicative of the damp because they'd, they'd eaten it so much. Um, I think if you're seeing, I'm trying to think what the most simple thing to look for, but I mean, it, Chalk, calcareous habitats tend to be, they have a slightly better representation of fine leaf grasses such as fescue. So I'd say visually, if you're seeing a lot more fine stuff, that might point you in the direction of calcareous. I mean, I always think with habitats like that, what I tend to do is try and find an edge somewhere where the sheep aren't, you know, even if it's just a, a square metre, and then often all your indicator species are in that spot. Um, and that's the way to do it. But it's very, it's it sort of quite tightly grazed sheep habitat is is very, very difficult to, to identify and get a feel of. And often it's the, the thing that they take, you sort of, you go to it, and you think this is tremendously dull. And then they take the sheep off and two weeks later, incredible things come up and you think, oh, crikey, I'm glad I waited. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. There's a couple of points there that I should make that, um, if you are wanting to know what it is and you do find a patch like beneath some fencing or something where it has grown up and you can see enough of the species, obviously that's not necessarily going to be your plot, but that will tell you what sort of habitat you should be recording your plot at. Um, it's worth pointing out what you were saying, Dom, that some people often think that if it's heavily grazed sheep pasture, then it's completely improved and there's nothing of value and I shouldn't even be bothering to do it as an MPMS plot, where actually, as you say, if it's simply that the management is just not correct but actually underneath it all if it was given a chance you know and, and that's what we're here to monitor isn't it it might be that if it's kept to sheep grazing for the next five years then you're going to record very little in it however you know what if we can change things in the next five years so that some areas aren't so heavily intensively grazed then you might find that things pop up so it is worth bearing that in mind so keep going even if you think it's the most dullest site in the world and I also say that if there is a dull plot that you're doing you know we've got the extra species records form that you can submit extra information so if you're walking up to your plot and you did see some other really nice things then by all means use the extra species form to record those and you can put the specific location they just don't want to know the abundance that's all um so you know you're still adding data there which is quite interesting Anyway, we've got another question here that's come in. Um, does fragrant orchid have a symbiotic relationship with fungus and does it have specific pollinators? 
I suppose uh, thinking about that long uh, nectar tube um, with the pollinators in mind. So all orchids have very, very strong mycorrhizal interactions. I don't think there's any of them which can cope without it, which is why even if you collect orchid seed and spread it on a patch of land, it, it completely is sort of its own master in terms of whether it grows. It's not something you can ever sow. Um, and sort of without going into huge detail, the seeds, they enter a mycorrhizal relationship deep in the soil and they can actually stay as this sort of propagule underground for up to five years before the plant appears, which we're, and we're starting to understand a bit more about that. But um, yeah, it's really, really complicated. In terms of pollinators, I don't know, because you're absolutely right. I mean, if you were in the tropics and something had an X tube like that, you'd expect a kind of hummingbird or something similar to have that relationship with it. I don't know. I mean, a lot of the orchids are funny because they 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 have these they produce these incredible structures and colours and lures like the bee orchid to attract insects, but actually they're not insect pollinated. They tend to be very heavily self pollinated, which is so unusual for something which has gone to all that trouble to create you know something looking exactly like a bee and in this country no bee orchids are pollinated by bees so it's a really sort of bizarre quirk of it um i don't know about fragrant orchid i'm hoping me blabbing away has given you just enough time to google it quickly sarah and then google it, but you know um i would say maybe because it's fragrant maybe there's an element of moth pollination i don't know because they all have the long tongues that are almost similar to sort of um hummingbirds and things and, and obviously they got their big fluffy um, antennae, so I don't know, maybe I'd have to look it up. Oh, oh, by the way, just to note that it is Adonis blue that um, breeds on uh, horseshoe vetch, because yeah. in your presentation you were like, is it Adonis? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so hard remembering all the, um, remember because it's, it's a question which comes up so much food plants, and it's such a good question. Because, you know, it's a big part of, obviously, plants are wonderful in their own right, but, they, you know, it's a massive part of what they do. And having every food plant by memory oh, is yeah. it's yeah. such a, a skill of intellect, which is definitely beyond me. But, yeah. um yeah, I'm glad I sort of had it on the tip of my, I think I was, it was the sort of thing, if I was in person, I'd say it and think, oh, I'll hopefully get away with that. And when you're doing it online, you think, oh, God, if I get it wrong. That'd be awful. So that's why I was having a wobble of confidence. But yeah, I'm glad I was vaguely right, just lacked lack the confidence in my conviction. Yeah. Well, before last weekend, I might not have been 100% sure, but I went specifically to a site to go and look for Adonis Blue. So uh, yeah, it's all in my head now. <laughs> um, uh, so we've got another thing here coming. So I've got 20 acres of natural grassland on limestone pavement in Anglesey, grazed by sheep and cattle. I'm pretty sure I could count 40 flower species and really have not looked at the grasses, but I have only got four of the flowers you've named. So there's a couple of things to point out here. Firstly, that in the calcareous grassland um, category, uh, there are some areas that are obviously on limestone pavement and particularly in the um, guidance notes, it does talk about sort of uh, in the north of England, how it might have the presence of blue moor grass and limestone bed straw and stuff like that, which obviously aren't on our NPMS indicator list. And that's specifically because if you were to look at something like blue moor grass, the, the MBN gateway shows that it's in a very few locations, so it's not going to be a relevant thing for a national scale project. And the other thing I would say um, is this is where the extra species records entry can go in. So if you've got four of those flowers that are on the list, great, you can put them in with the DOM in scale and they can go in your normal recording form if you're doing it at indicator level, for example. Um, however, if you've got all these other species that you can identify, then you could put them in as um, extra species records. Or if you feel confident enough, you can go and do it at inventory level and, you know, or maybe give yourself some time just to, um, you know, get to grips with some of the grasses and then you could do it at full inventory and that's all the species then. So yeah, a couple of options there anyway. I've never seen blue moor grass of you. Yeah, only on my sort of rare field trips up in the north and it is amazing. I, it's something I'm very sad we don't have more in the south. It's some. Um, I mean, it's not like bright blue, you know, it's all these hints of <laughs> yeah. blue shade green, but it is, um, yeah, it's really nice. I saw it, there's that iconic, um, the Pennine, where the Pennine Railway grows over that huge viaduct, which I've now forgotten the name of, and there's loads of it growing on the rocks underneath that. That was the first time I saw it, and it was, yeah, it's very exciting. It's really nice to see a new 
a new grass you don't get to see a lot so it is it's very very wonderful and iconic of the north Definitely. um so we haven't got any more questions coming in i thought i'd show you something john while i've got you on here that um, and and everyone which is um a little bit amusing which is oh let me just move this out of the way because i can't see what i'm doing um so i went to pick this up uh the other day now this is false oak grass um florette that somebody has made um and it's rather spectacular and i'm going to be using it in my classes for grasses videos about flower structure uh, grass structure uh, flower structure so they've gone to the effort of obviously doing the lemma with the awn and the palea and they've got the glooms and inside they've even done the hairy appendages on <laughs> um um the what's the word i've lost the word um ovary thank you and they've got the stigmas and they've got all the stamens hanging off with little bees in um, and even to the point she's made two different culms like grass stem examples one with an enclosed sheath and, and one with an open sheath here and she's done the ligule of a ring of hairs on this one <laughs> And then she's done the ligule that's membranous here with the oracles. So I'm going to be using all of those props in my thing, but also I made my own grass spikelet out of felt. <laughs> um, you can then take off the individual um, florets out of so that you could see that that's how they fit in together as one, one spikelet. So there you go. <laughs> that is absolutely epic. Know, What's so, the material? The the full set. I mean, your one is absolutely amazing. What material is that? Um, that isn't as amazing. I made it in an hour and a half. She probably spent like weeks on hers, obviously. Yeah. And um, she's made it. She is an artist as well as um a uh, flora recorder, but she's made it out of this sort of stuff that you would put into fabrics to stiffen them when you're making dressmaking and stuff. Uh, okay yeah yeah and then this bit's just a bamboo stick and then she's got straws that she's just super glued little um yellow beads in for the for the pollen and, and goodness knows what else she's done in here an old flannel i think is the ovary yeah, yeah. Um, but, and she's made the other thing she's got she's got um uh rumex bit things and atropex and all these massive models of different things that you wow. can very cool i said i'm going to help add to her collection we can go around the country showing them yeah <laughs> that is amazing yeah. it's also it's nice to sort of nice to think that somewhere in the in our huge universe there's probably a planet where all the grasses are that big there's something quite sort of they're quite sort of like doctor who props from an alien an alien world where grasses are that big but um oh that's amazing that's a it's yeah. a i love it when um art and art and nature kind of meet it's always really nice to have those two disciplines coming together so um yeah that's fantastic Hopefully that will be a useful resource. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dom, uh, for tonight for the questions and everything. Thank, thank you. Thank you. As I said, it will be on YouTube as well when I get round to it. Um, so brilliant. Good night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Friday night. Right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>